What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of the sit down. As always, enjoy this video. Please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock and seeing this for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get into another very interesting mafia topic. Over the last couple of months, I have noticed on YouTube, every Tom, Dick, and Harry is releasing what the current mafia in America looks like today. The videos are strewn with the wrong photos, wrong information, and more. Now, I have seen some people do it the right way. The best has been done by R.J. Roger, who did a very good video on the families around America, not just New York. We have also on this channel done the same thing. Today though, as we embark on 2023, we're in the last month of 2022, I felt it pertinent to do it right. It's important that mob historians continue to talk about today in the American mafia. The mob is not like it used to be, but it is still running. Today I'm gonna to talk about all five families, and who's in control currently. The story next on Sit Down Shorts, the first family we are going to get into is the Bonanno crime family. According to the federal government, the current boss in late 2022 is Michael the Nose Mancuso. Currently, Mancuso is 67 years old. Now, he goes back very deep in the Bonanno crime family. He would actually, early in his career, serve 10 years in state prison for manslaughter after his wife was found dead on a street bench. Mancuso would eventually get out and align with his old friend, former boss, Vincent Basciano. Now, in 2004, as many of us know, Joey Messino in the early 2000s would go away a power vacuum would come up. There was a ruling panel, but eventually Vincent Basciano would become the boss of the Bonanno crime family. It was short-lived, but he would name Mancuso as his underboss. However, in December of 2004 and into 2005, Mancuso would be indicted after the Fed said he took part in a murder of an individual called Randy Pizzola. According to the Feds, Basciano would instruct Mancuso to tell younger members of the family to take out Pozzola. The trigger man in December of 2004 of Pozzola was Anthony Ace Aiello. Mancuso's role was the messenger. He got the information to Anthony Aiello. Mancuso would eventually get 15 years for that little stunt and get out in 2019. Now, during his time in prison, he would eventually take on the mantle of boss. He would eventually lose that title and was replaced by people like Vinny TV, Battlementi, and John Camerano around 2015. Now, upon his release and close to his release in 2017, he would seize control of the family again and down the road shelve Mr. Camerano, the boss, uh, for several different rule violations. Today, as a free man, Mancuso is said to be again, the boss of the family, he would be in 2022 involved in a bizarre dust up where many people who follow the mob would say that in a funeral at uh, Vito Grimaldi's funeral, a former capo in the family, he instructed Mancuso to uh, have members of the family beat up Mr. John Camerano, who he was told to stay away from that funeral. Camerano did not stay away because he was the son-in-law of Vito Grimaldi. Mancuso instructed family members to allegedly beat him up. I don't know how long Mr. Mancuso will stay on the street, but judging by his behavior recently, I don't know if it's going to be very long. I guess we'll have to wait and see. The alleged underboss of the family is John Johnny Skyway Palazzola. Now, Palazzola is from Queens and was inducted in the family in 1977. Down the road, he would do 10 years for attempted murder. At one point, he was in the crew of disgraced informant 
James Tartaglione. He would down the road take over his own crew and is now a high-ranking member of the Bonanno crime family. The question today in the Bonanos is, who's the consigliere? Now, I have two options who I think it could be. It's possible the current consigliere is Vincent Vinny TV, Battle Lamenti. Now, Battle Lamenti is from Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, and at one point was a huge loan shark and extortion artist. During the early 2010s, he would, for a poor period of time, take over as acting boss of the family for Mancuso. Battle Lamenti is a respected member of the Bonanno crime family, though my money on who the consigliere is is actually this individual, Thomas Tommy D. Di Fiore. Now, Di Fiore is a longtime member of the Bonanno crime family and is in his mid to late 70s. Di Fiore at one point was a member of the Phil Lucky Giacconi crew. As we know, Giacconi was killed in the three capos hit. Down the road, Di Fiore would become a capo and is now based in Long Island. He would be arrested in 2014 in a RICO indictment involving another member of the family, Vinny Asaro. Here we can see Di Fiore being led out of the federal building alongside FBI agents. Again, I don't exactly know who the consigliere in the Bonanno family is, but Di Fiore at his age does play an interesting role, and I feel like he is well-liked by most, is older, and is likely a great counselor. That's what a consigliere is in the end. The second family we are going to talk about is the most dysfunctional. As always, the Colombo crime family have a lot going on. They have been at war for years and are still very jumbled. We have no idea currently who the boss of the Colombo crime family is. If I had to put my money on it, I'm going to do that. And I'll tell you who that is in just a second. Before, though, I want to get into why the current family is such a mess. In September of 2021, the federal government would drop a huge indictment down on virtually every high-ranking member of the family. At the time, the boss was Carmine Persco's cousin, Andrew Mush Russo. As we know, though, in 2022, Mush Russo would die of natural causes. It is interesting to know that in 2020, though, Mush Russo allegedly said that in 2023, when Theodore Teddy Persco Jr. was released off monitoring and after his prison sentence, he wanted him to become the next boss of the Colombo crime family. The problem is, in that same 2021 indictment, Teddy Persco is also named and is headed back to prison and is currently in prison. So whether he becomes boss or not, I don't know. But he is said to be the future of the Colombo crime family. To me, if it is not Teddy Persco, the likely boss is Joel Joe Waverly Kikase. Now, Kikase is uh, someone that goes back many years in the family and was a heavyweight and enforcer for many of those years. At one point, it was said that he ordered a hit on former police officer Ralph Doles. Ralph Doles was dating the ex-wife of Mr. Kikase. Kikase would face a trial in that case and beat the rap. He is known to be a violent lunatic and depraved individual. He has sur survived multiple assassination attempts and is in his late 70s. If he is still involved with the mafia, it is likely at a high-ranking level. And at one point in the 2000s, he did act as acting boss. The underboss of the Colombo crime family is still said to be Benjamin Benji Costalzo. Now, Costalzo was also named in that 2021 indictment. He goes all the way back to the 80s. He would be inducted into the family in 1991. Castellazzo is a Brooklyn guy, as many of the Colombos are. Now, in the indictment, it would say he was directly involved in attempting to vie control of local Union 621 in Flushing, Queens. The consigliere is still said to be Ralph DiMatteo. Now, DiMatteo is from Gravesend, Brooklyn. 
And he goes back very deep as well in the Colombo crime family. Di Matteo is the brother of longtime heavyweight in the Colombos, Luca Di Matteo. Now, Ralph Di Matteo goes uh, into the 80s. He was a large scale heroin dealer and at one point would go to prison for selling H. Now, in the 2021 indictment, he would be named. However, he would not be rounded up by the FBI. The FBI had no idea where he was. Everybody wondered, where is Ralph Di Matteo and why was he not arrested in this case, even though he was named? He would, though, pop up in a bizarre Twitter photo that his son would post on his Twitter account. As is seen here in this photo, Di Matteo can be seen sunning in the pool in Florida. His wife is actually seen behind him. Now, his son, Angelo Di Matteo, would quickly delete the photo. However, the feds already had it. Down the road, Di Matteo would surrender to the federal government. This just goes to show you what the mafia is today. People like these kids of these people do not think and just post away. It's probably not a good idea to post a photo of your father taunting the FBI after he was not arrested in a long-range indictment. Di Matteo is currently out on bail. A wild story, nonetheless. The third family we're going to get into is one of the more powerful, the Gambino crime family. To me, the current boss is Lorenzo Menino. Now, I will say that in the Gambino crime family, I do feel like, like the Genovese, they kind of adopt this two-party system and that Menino and another individual are likely both making decisions for the family and that they've kind of consolidated the boss under boss and are just kind of one. To me, though, the decision maker every day is Lorenzo Menino. Lorenzo Menino is an interesting individual and goes very far back in the Gambino crime family, way back to the 80s. He would actually be identified on wiretap as an up-and-comer in the family by John Gotti. Now, Menino was very much early involved in the Brooklyn uh, area, and he was actually coming up around Sicilian heavyweight drug dealers, John and Joseph Gambino. As we know, they were huge heroin dealers at one point. Now, Lorenzo Menino would be identified by former underboss Sammy Gravano as taking part in the 1991 murder of Gambino associate Francesco Oliveri. Now, Oliveri, like the Gambinos, was a drug dealer and at one point likely took out one of the Gambinos' men. The Gambinos would instruct multiple members of the family to kill Oliveri in Astoria, Queens. Now, Gravano would identify Menino that day as the driver in that hit. The trigger man was alleged to be longtime Gambino hitman and New Jersey-born gangster Robert Bobby Gabbert Basaccia. Now, Basaccia would die several years ago. Benito is a very respected individual and has also been uh, very much someone that we've seen a lot uh, around recently. According to ganglandnews.com, just last week, Menino was seen attending the funeral of Lucchese heavyweight Frank Lasterino. Now, this is interesting because there is a connection here to the Gambinos. We have to ask ourselves, why was Lorenzo Menino attending the funeral of the man many people believe killed former Gambino heavyweight Bobby Borriello? Maybe we could assume that Cooler heads have prevailed and that the families have all forgiven each other for that hit. Lorenzo Menino is still, though, very active. To me, leads the family. The other very important person in the Gambinos, though older now, is Italian Dom Cefalu. Now, Cefalu is Sicilian and also goes all the way back to the 80s. He was also very involved in drug trafficking, and he was sponsored into the family in late 1990 by Pasquale Patsy Conti. Conti, as we know, is a huge heroin dealer. I did a video on him at one point. Now, in 2002, Italian Dom Cefalu was identified as a copper regime in the early 2000s. 
he is said to be very respected. And though he is in his 80s, is likely still involved in the family. My thought is he's taken on a more reserved role and Menino runs the day-to-day. I still would identify him basically as the number two in the Gambino crime family. Now, the consigliere of this family, uh, allegedly, is an interesting one. It is said to be Michael Mickey Boy Paradiso. Now, none, unlike the individuals we just discussed in Chefalu and Menino, Paradiso is not part of the Sicilian wing. He goes, though, all the way back uh, to the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club crew led by John Gotti. Paradiso is from Brooklyn, but at one point was very close with the Gotti crew. At one point in the early 70s, Paradiso and Gotti actually got into uh, a assault, a physical altercation, and Paradiso allegedly slapped John Gotti in the 70s. Now, they would become close and ultimately become very uh, good friends uh, down the road, and Gotti would actually involve Paradiso in the upper echelon of the family in the late 80s. Now, Paradiso is a violent and depraved individual and is said to have killed many people, according to himself. Uh, He would say on wiretap, talking to his brother, that he killed multiple people, one of which was for his brother. Now, his lawyer would say that he was just letting off steam at one point. But this is an individual that has been caught many times on camera uh, lamenting about all sorts of things. He at one point said that younger gangsters are not as tough as him and that, quote, he doesn't give a fuck about going to jail. Paradiso is still said to be very active. And as I know, and as I've talked about before, multiple people have seen him in social clubs still to this day. Paradiso is a stone cold gangster and is one of the only true actual gangsters left. His violent and sadistic stare will probably send shockwaves through you. My advice would be to stay far away from Michael Paradiso, though it has been reported in years past that he's actually a pretty nice guy. I have to feel like if I ever saw him, he probably wouldn't be too nice to me because I uh, report on him on a daily basis. However, Paradiso is an interesting person and is said to still be pretty respected even by the Sicilian members of the family. The next family we're going to get into is probably the most powerful the Genovese crime family. They have been a well-oiled machine for a lot of years. Since the late 90s, it is said that the boss of the family is Laborio Barney Belomo. Now, Belomo is a prodigy, if you will. He was made at the very young age of 20. And by the age of 30, he was made boss by former heavyweight Vincent Giganti. Now, early in Belomo's career, Fat Tony Salerno was approached by the father of Belomo, Salvatore, asking Salerno to take care of the kid. And that's exactly what the Genovese did. It was identified very early. The Laborio Belomo was a, an accomplished leader and someone that could completely take control of the running of the family down the road. Belomo is elusive and very secretive. We don't hear much about him. Though, interestingly enough, he would be caught on Google Street View at one point coming out of a pizzeria in the Bronx. Kind of interesting. We haven't seen much from Belomo, but recently, early last year, he was seen in this photo at a birthday party. The number two man in the family, like the Gambinos, I believe they established kind of a two-party system. The number two is a close confidant of Belomo, Michael Ragusa. Now, Ragusa, like Belomo, is very secretive. In fact, this is the only photo we have of Michael Ragusa. This, folks, is how gangsters should operate. In the shadows, nobody knows who the hell they are. They could walk down the street and no one would know them. The truth of the matter is, I don't care who you are and I don't care what time you're in, you should not be gallivanting around as a gangster behaving like some of these people do. These two individuals, including Ragusa, have taken on the right role as a gangster. Now, Ragusa was arrested in the early 2000s in an investigation involving the ILA, the International Longshoremen Association, and he would do a short prison stint for his behavior. We have not heard a peep from Ragusa since, and as I said, he operates 
in the shadows. The current underboss of the Genovese crime family is said to be Ernest Ernie Muscarella. Now, Muscarella, like Belomo, is a Harlem guy and at one point was the head of the powerful 116th Street crew, a crew that goes all the way back to beginning the beginning of the mafia. Now, Muscarella would also be involved in the same indictment in the early 2000s involving the ILA. He, like Belomo and Ragusa, are extre is extremely secretive. We don't hear much from him either. Now, the consigliere is a secret. We have very little idea who the consigliere is. Now, to me, my money is on Pasquale, Uncle Patty Falchetti. Once Muscarella became a high-ranking member, it is said that Falchetti would take over his old 116th Street crew. He also is a Harlem guy and is very close with the three individuals that I just mentioned. Falchetti is a longtime loan shark and at one point would actually give disgraced Lucchese and Genovese associate Anthony Zoccolillo $34,000. Falchetti would head to prison for that behavior. Now, Falchetti recently is still said to be connected to the mafia. And in fact, in 2017, he would be seen at a diner with Gambino heavyweight and huge earner Andrew Campos. Why is someone that is not involved with the mob meeting secretly with another member of the mob? Probably not a great idea nowadays, Mr. Falchetti. Now, I don't have any proof that he is the consigliere. I'm just throwing things around. It's probable that he is a high-ranking member, and he would make sense as far as the other members of this crew and the upper echelon. They're all from the same area and have all been friends for years. The final crew we are going to talk about today is the final alphabetical five family. It's the Lucchese crime family. Now, I will say this about the Lucchese crime family. They are burgeoning again. They have quality leadership, and it's going to be interesting to see what goes on. As we know, in the mid-2010s, the upper echelon, including Matthew Madonna and Stephen Crea, were sent to prison for life. Now, at some point, they may get a new trial in that alleged hit on Michael Meldish. We'll have to wait and see. But the current leadership was handpicked by former boss Vic Amuso. The current boss, allegedly, of the family is Michael Big Mike DeSantis. Now, DeSantis goes way back in the family as well. He is a loyal Vic Amuso supporter and was, as I said, handpicked by Amuso. At one point, though, Mr. DeSantis would spend nearly 20 years in prison for his involvement in multiple murders, including the attempted murder of former boss and mob rat Little Al Diarco at the Kimberly Hotel in Manhattan. Now, that hit would never go down, but it was said that DeSantis was directly involved in it. He would be released in 2010 after spending 18 years inside. He, like many of the bosses we just talked about, are fairly elusive. The underboss allegedly is the beer drinking Patrick Patty De La Russa. Now, I say that in a funny way. Obviously, he has a beer in this picture, and he looks to be a fairly normal individual. Does this not look like someone you would see at the corner bar after a softball game chugging back a beer? Looks like a pretty normal individual. Now, De La Russo, according to the feds, though, is a violent mobster who is from Brooklyn. At one point, De La Russo was in the old Vario crew, which would become the Cutea crew in the 2000s. He is said to be very involved in unions and like DeSantis, an Amuso loyalist. The consigliere is also an interesting individual. It is this person, Andrew DeSimone. Now, this is a very old photo of De Simone, but he is a very powerful person as well. He, unlike the other two, is actually from the Bronx faction. De Simone is the son of former Lucchese Capo regime, Sally Bo De Simone. Now, Sally Bo was a very powerful person, and he allowed his two sons to be connected to the mob. Now, Andrew De Simone's brother 
Anthony DeSimone would actually get 25 years to life in prison for a murder in 2000 as he was involved with the Tanglewood Boys, a farm team in Yonkers. However, Anthony DeSimone would actually be released after seven years after that conviction was re- uh, was uh, overturned. His other son would climb the ranks of the Lucchese family and be named Consigliere at some point in the 2010s. He is said to be very respected and a gentleman. That's the five families today as we head out of 2022. The one common theme with all of the people that we talked about today is that they're fairly old. 99% of the membership in the mafia is over the age of 55. Where's the new young blood? Now, several members, high-ranking members, are in prison, and they will get out at some point. The problem for the mafia now is that the rackets they were once leaders involved with are now very much drying up. Unions are not as easy to infiltrate. You can't extort a Starbucks or a Home Depot. And nowadays, murder is off the table. Gambling is very much different now, though still important due to the fact that New York has not legalized gambling. That will likely happen at some point, and that will kick out another racket the mob doesn't have anymore. Loans are cool, and you can create legit businesses. The major problem the mafia has today is that they are no longer feared. At one point, people like myself could never do what I'm doing right now. The mob ruled with an iron fist, very similar to the way Mexican drug cartels operate. If you fucked with the mafia, you would be killed. Today, informants walk around these neighborhoods with very little worry. The mob is not respected anymore. It is very low on the criminal totem pole in New York. It's remained to be seen what happens next with the mob. But there's one thing clear. They're still around just not as powerful. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure you hit the like button. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.